partner. And, let, me, let me just say, I got this. Um, the, the lover is conspicuously absent uh, from the entire chapter in the Torah. We're, what we're going to be doing in the hour and a quarter we have is really looking at three distinctly different texts in order to bring it to a more modern consideration for what the Sota might teach us today. We're gonna to look at the biblical text and try to understand a little bit of the context in which the Torah, the time at which the Torah is written and what else is going on around questions of suspected adultery in parallel cultures and religions. We're then gonna look at the rabbinic reframing of this text. It's actually quite fascinating because the Mishnah completely reworks the biblical text uh, turning the Sota ordeal into something else entirely. And finally, we're going to look at some Midrashim that I think particularly illuminate uh, the insight or understanding Chazal had, the rabbis of the Midrashic period had, in um, and seeing the nuance and complexity within the spaces uh, or between the spaces of the text and the particulars of the ritual. So that's really, we have a lot to accomplish and, uh, and a lot to learn together. I'm very excited. I'm going to share my source sheet. I will pause periodically to be able to take questions and open it up for a little bit of discussion. Okay, so um, we're going to open up, of course, with the biblical text. Let me go back to the beginning. Okay. So um, before we even start, there's a pasuk that I they often forget to put into the source sheet, but it's a pasuk that appears a few verses before, maybe five verses before the sota, that I think is important to, uh, to read first in order to understand the language of the sota. So if you happen to have a Tanakh next to you, you can open it up. If not, you can listen to me. I am in chapter five, verse five. The Sota begins with Yud Aleph. So I'm actually going back six Psukim, or really it's going to be five Psukim, um, because there's a parallel language that bears noticing. The Yedaber Adonai al Moshe Lemor, of course, that starts the same way. Daber al Bnei Yisrael, Ish o Isha ki Yaasu mikol chatot Adam, Lim o Mal Badonai. So what we have here is Again, five short psukim before we open up with the sota, we have God saying to Moshe, when a man or a woman, first of all, we don't often have a command directed to ish o isha. A lot of times it's much more generic, much more general, but that forces us to kind of focus in and recognize that the text is being very particular. Men and women are both accountable for what we're about to read. And what we find out is ki yasumi kol chatot adam, which really means chatot ben adam lechaveiro. When a man or women woman engages in some sort of misdeed, misbehavior, one towards the other, limo mal badonai. To me, that is just an, an amazing, amazing juxtaposition. That when we wrong one another, there's an element of miila of betrayal, of going astray towards God. The juxtaposition of ben adam l'chaveiro to ben adam l'makom is so beautifully illustrated in the words of this verse that when you wrong one another, there's a sense of mi'ila. Now, mi'ila, for those who study Gemara know, the long, sometimes tedious conversations about mi'ila in the Talmud largely have to do, predominantly have to do, with misuse of temple property or things associated with korbanot and mikdash. When you misappropriate or misuse something, that's a form of mi'ila. So here, it has nothing to do with mikdash. It's not about the koanim. It's not about the Levi'im. The word mi'ila here is much broader. And really, it's about breaking faith with God. Now, we can understand how that gets used in the context of mikdash, but we're less familiar with the usage of word, the word mi'ila when it comes to a broad concept of breaking faith with God by our own misbehavior towards one another. 
And really, I really think if we were, we were sitting in a classroom, we, we could go very deep with this idea, the word mi'ilah in the mikdash and the word mi'ilah here regarding misbehavior towards one another, which seems to parallel misbehavior in the mikdash where God's presence rests, really a lot to think about. But what I want to uh, call to our attention is this idea, again, of breaking faith with God by being abusive, or mistreating one another. And I'm gonna bring that now into our SOTA text because it bears attention. Take a look at what happens in Yud Bet. So now that was Pasuk Vav, what I just read, and, and either you had it in front of you or you didn't, you can look it up after. And now we're moving to the SOTA text. So we already know that there's an element of betrayal, of breaking faith with God when man or woman performs some sort of chait, some sort of chatat ha'adam, chatot ha'adam, within the context of ben adam l'chavero, and now we're ready for the sota. V'yedaber Adonai al Moshe le'mor, daber el b'nei Yisrael va'amarta alehem, ish ish ki tiste ishto, u'ma'ale bo ma'al. Now to me they're saying, again, the, the, the parallel is, uh, is very, very important here, that when a man's wife goes astray, and I want us to, to pay attention to the text opening up with surety over her guilt. In other words, this is not it, well, if she goes astray, yes, but the presumption for the next few psukim is that she has broken faith, that she has gone astray, she has broken faith with him. So there's a presumed guilt. We're going to see a little further on that there's also presumed in it. Well, there's possible innocence. But what we have here, kitiste ishto umaalebo maal. Wait a minute. I just saw maal. I had limol maal badonai a few psukim earlier. And this to me reinforces the particular heinousness of the sin of adultery. Now, I, I want to go back several thousand years. Because adultery to us today, well, we recognize it's a terrible betrayal, right? First of all, we recognize it's a betrayal when a man has an affair and when a woman has an affair. In other words, we, we tend not to put more weight on a woman committing adultery than a man committing adultery. And we're not going to go into the halachic particulars if a man has an affair with an unmarried woman. His wife considers that to be a tremendous breaking of faith, a betrayal of their vows, of the fidelity they promised to one another, in the same way that a man considers it to be infidelity when a woman has an affair, and it doesn't matter who she has an affair with. When we go back to the biblical text, however, adultery is defined very, very uh, narrowly. A married woman who has an affair with a man other than her husband not a married man having multiple sexual partners, a man could have multiple wives and concubines and handmaidens and so on. So adultery looks very different in this source than it does for us today when we think of adultery. And perhaps at the end, we'll talk about our uh, modern perception of adultery. What I wanna flesh out here is a little bit different. Why is adultery such a big deal beyond the obvious? In other words, one of the things that happens back in Breshit, to remind us of Breshit, is that Abraham is so afraid that Pharaoh will kill him in order to take his wife, right? He says that to both Pharaoh and Abimelech, right? That um, why is murder more justifiable than adultery? The understanding there is neither Pharaoh nor Abimelech will dare to commit adultery but both of them would have less of a problem with killing the husband to get to the wife. And of course, it's one of the Ten Commandments. And here we have suspected adultery as a platform for mi'ila, for the worst kind of breaking faith. And now I'm going to share with you something that I've developed, an interpretive arc that I've developed to perhaps explain why we give so much weight to the story of the Sota. And what I'd like to suggest is adultery is really a microcosm for essentially betrayal of God. And let me explain a little bit more. When 
God takes B'nai Yisrael at, at Har Sinai and gives them the Torah, chooses them and gives them the Torah. We all know that the metaphor that is used in the Nevi'im and then in the Midrash is husband and wife. The idea that God has taken B'nai Yisrael in marriage and given them the Torah. And as a result, when we talk about the betrayal, the destruction, Eicha, and then of course Yermiyahu and Yeshayahu and so on, use the metaphor, the image of the fornicating wife, of the wife whose skirts are steeped in zima, steeped in fornication and adultery. And if we, so, so the idea that betrayal is most starkly illuminated by the betrayal of a husband, a wife, I'm sorry, going, uh, committing adultery, being unfaithful to her husband, breaking faith with her husband, to me really reflects the bigger picture. What it represents is, is enormously beyond the individual story of this husband and wife. Society, our society, demands faithfulness to God, and that is also represented by faithfulness of wife to husband. And then if I go sideways to the ancient Near East, which is the last thing I'm going to say before we go back to the text. In the ancient Near East, one of the most heinous crimes is adultery. And, and as a result, the king can be involved in a man accusing his wife of adultery. In the same way here, we, we're going to have the priest, the Kohen. Why is it the business of the king? Why is a woman suspected of adultery? Why is that a capital crime? Why is that not a personal situation, a personal affair? And I believe as well, the idea of a woman betraying her husband on a small scale represents the, ki the king's fear that his subjects will break faith with him. In other words, this becomes a model in every household for what faithfulness looks like. And when a woman betrays her husband in the same way B'nai Israel betray God are compared to a, a, an adulterous wife, so too in the ancient Near East, a woman betraying her husband threatens the entire fabric of society. Because in every home, there is a model of faithfulness, which of course is meant to, uh, to, to, to sp um, move outward, to, uh, to illuminate or illustrate what faithfulness in the kingdom looks like. And so in the ancient Near East, a woman suspected of adultery also was put through an ordeal, a trial in which her faithfulness is tested. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through the text. So all of this introduction is really because of the usage, ma'alebo ma'a, which when I read this verse, every time I read this verse, I can't help but go backwards five verses. This idea of lim on ma'al badonai, that's in, even though God is not directly addressed here, the text essentially pulls the two together and reminds us, kiti ste ishto ma'alebo ma'al is not just to her husband. It's ultimately towards God because this represents on a small scale what faithfulness or infidelity looks like in our relationship, not only between one another, but between B'nai Yisrael and God. So I hope that there was something you know, that was clear. I'm now gonna move on to the text, but all of this was in Trinidad. Why, why do we spend so much time on the Sota? Why is the Sota such an important narrative? Well, we're gonna see Lifnei Adonai appear twice in this, uh, in this text. In other words, this is not only about a husband and wife. This really is about faithfulness, between one another and also between us and God. Okay, moving on. So what we have here is a man lying with a woman, with this woman, with this accused woman, they make it very clear, a situation where a man essentially um, leaves his zera within the woman. And it is concealed from the eyes of her Isha. Now, I want to pause for a moment because often the, the husband is called the Baal. Therefore, in, in modern feminist critique, that idea of a man being the Baal, the master, has led certain more egalitarian households to not use the language of Baal, but to represent their, their partner, a Benzug or a Batzug, right? Partner, Ish Isha, 
The idea of Baal suggests some sort of mastery. Here, the language is not Baal. I taught this in Camp Moshava over Shavuot, and one of the Israeli shlichim said, it's interesting, Isha. Normally, we think of the Isha as almost an extension of the Ish. Right? She just gets a hey attached to her word, to her name. Ish, Isha, because she comes from Ish. But here, the Isha is really about the husband. So it's her man, meaning the focus is she has betrayed her Isha. So it's almost like in reverse, the Isha is the focus, right? This is not about the Baal. The Baal is the master. If he were really the Baal, the clear power dynamic would prevent her from breaking faith. Here, he is vulnerable because she has done something as the Isha, and now her Ish is threatened, right? He's now vulnerable and exposed because she has had relations with another man and within her body, Vinistara, and it's been concealed from the eyes of her husband. Because one of the things that happens, of course, is that the woman's body conceals the Sheikh Zera. He has no idea what's going on. Her body has concealed from him the act and the proof of the act. It's kind of been swallowed up as, if you will, the nistara and concealed. And the Torah reminds us, she is tmea. And here too, there's almost a, a play on words because a woman becomes tmea every time she has relations. Her husband's shechvat zera, go back to Parsha Tazria, makes her tmea. So of course she's tmea. She's tmea every time she has relations with her husband, but here she's nitma'a. She's also defiled, right? So there's the v'shachav ishota shechvat zara, which she may in parallel be carrying out with her husband. All of this is concealed within her body. She's nitma'a, but that would be normal, except she's nitma'a. She's defiled. The aid einba, and there's no witness. If there were a witness, this would be a lot easier. The lonit pasa. And she has not been, now here we also have a word, a, a double intention. Nit pasa, she hasn't been caught, but also lonit pasa, she hasn't been forced. Right, So very uh, quickly, the Torah fleshes out a situation where she has done this, and the reason he doesn't know is her body has concealed the evidence. Of course, Sheikh Zera isn't going to be proof because she has a husband, and he also has Sheikh Zera. And Eidein, by no witnesses, Velonit Pasa, and the Torah makes it clear if she was forced, there's no sota. You can't accuse your wife of being an adulteress if she's Nit Pasa if she's been uh, forced to have uh, the relationship, if the man has forced her and she hasn't been caught. Okay. And as a result, right, of this suspicion, of his sense that something is off, a ruach kina comes over him, the kineat ishto, and he uh, is, is jealous of his wife. The Mishnah is going to turn this into an action which is he warns his wife, but the Torah does not have that. Uh, uh, that's not the literal meaning of the Torah. Now, so far from Yud Aleph until Yud Dalid, there is a clear presumption of guilt, right? She's done it, she's broken faith with him. And then we get again, there is clear presumption of guilt so far as readers perhaps were comfortable with what's about to unfold because she has broken faith. She has been unfaithful in the most base of ways, concealing this from her husband. And this is the part that many modern readers get stuck on. The idea that a man can have uh, jealousy, a ruach kina v'kineyat ishto, and this becomes toxic within the relationship. The kina is now at the focus of his interaction with his wife, and she's done nothing wrong. She has not been defiled. And so the ceremony is going to unfold, whether she is nitma'a or not nitma'a, from this moment onward, we have to hold both possibilities. From Pasukia Dalit, we have to recognize 
that both the guilty wife and the innocent wife are going to have to go through this ritual in order to vindicate her, to absolve her of this ruach kina. And while we might be sympathetic to the guilty wife going through this process, we are less comfortable with an innocent woman being dragged through this, uh, this not so simple process in order to assuage his jealousy. And I'll say one more thing before we go on, and then I'm happy if anyone wants to, to make a comment because we're, we're gonna go through the next groups who came more quickly. Um, of course, we are very influenced by our modern awareness of this representing a power, an unhealthy, abusive power dynamic of men who are insanely jealous, unhealthily jealous of their wives' interaction with other men. And we all know, those of us certainly in the field and even those who are not, those of us who have daughters and granddaughters, red lights go off when we hear of a man who has a ruach kina vihilon nitma'a, right? That there's something wrong with a man who is insanely jealous, unreasonably jealous. And that definitely in, uh, infiltrates or influences our reading of the sota, the unfairness of it. So I'm gonna try again at the end to perhaps address that. But I do believe that there is an awareness that jealousy can unhinge or unsettle a relationship between husband and wife, sometimes it's justified and we as a society need to do something about that, right? Or the Torah says, we need to do something about that. And the Sota is the response. And sometimes it's unjustified. And there too, we need to address that in some way because unbalanced, disproportionate jealousy threatens essentially to, uh, to, to, to dissolve this entire or uh, unhinge this entire relationship, and perhaps we can find um, some reasonable measure as we read through this story, as we read through the innocent woman going through this process, that will help us have some sort of resolution as we get to the end, why she needs to go through it as well. Okay, I'm going to stop for just a moment, take a, um, a precious moment. Anyone have a comment or a question? that they want, to, uh, they want to bring up before I continue. Something I've said, I've already uh, brought in a number of ideas and uh, perhaps someone wants to ask or share something. Yes, Phil. This isn't the question, it's a, it's a plea. Could you enlarge the... Uh, enlarge the screen, yes. I will try to do that, absolutely. Thanks. Okay, anyone else? Yes, Harold. Well, based, uh, reacting to what you just said, the fact is that uh, the imagery that the Torah uses regarding God uh, in this whole uh, light is a jealous God. In other words, the, the, the attribute of jealousy is one that is attributed to God himself uh, at legitimate uh, and, not in any, in any, and not necessarily pejorative uh, in a negative sense. So I would just kind of throw that out. No, so first of all, thank you, because God is a jealous God when we break faith with God. So that reinforces my earlier um, interpretation, which is the mi'ila on a small scale is really uh, reflective of the fear of what it represents on a larger scale. And, and when we go astray, God becomes very jealous and, of course, unleashes his wrath and, and terrible things happen. Um, but I don't believe we see God as a jealous God when we're not breaking faith, right? That seems to be um, particularly human, a human attribute. And here too, uh, she's going to go through the process, Lifnei Hashem. So perhaps what we're meant to say is God is going to try to find some sort of resolution for this particularly very human uh, um, experience of jealousy, which is unjustified. We'd like to hope God's jealousy is only justified or that uh, description, right? A very human description of God's jealousy. But thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to use that. I like that, that God that reinforces my earlier idea. Yes, Phil, one more comment, and then I'm going to have to uh, go back to the text. God's jealousy has this different. Totally God's different. jealous what? God's jealousy is totally different from human jealousy. Human jealousy can be wrong. Yes, can, yes, yes, yes. God 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 jealous, yeah, yes, but God's jealousy is over infidelity. In other words, it when means, I was suggesting that. Don't like it. What? Jealousy for God means he doesn't like it. Doesn't mean there's an element of maybe making a mistake, while human jealousy right. is yeah. a mistake. Right. Absolutely, that's 
that I think is very well illustrated by this text. If we hadn't added the second clause, the idea that he lo nitma'a, I would really be able to continue what I started, which is this represents breaking faith and infidelity and ma'ilah ba Hashem. And really, again, uh, God and B'nai Israel are supposed to be, you know, B'nai Israel is supposed to be faithful to God and God gets jealous when we're unfaithful. And then, and I think Harold is correct and what you're saying is correct also, the difference between God and human beings or God and a husband is God can be unjust, uh, sorry, a, a human husband can be suspicious or unjustifiably jealous when she is innocent. And that really requires a, a different lens and, and of course distinguishes us completely from God. So yes, is that better, Phil? Uh, it's now bigger. Is this a better, uh, better size? I hope. Okay, so let me see if I can make it even a little bigger without losing, there we go, okay. Um, so what I wanna do now, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, just, I'm gonna read quickly, cause I do wanna get to some of the Mishnah and the, uh, the Midrash, um, is read through the, uh, the ritual. I'll just pause to say, I already mentioned the ancient Near East and there was a reason I mentioned it. I mentioned it because Bible scholars are very drawn to this text as really contrasting with parallel texts in the ancient Near East. In other words, in the ancient Near East, there is clear documentation of what are called trial by ordeal for the suspected adulteress. And certainly um, the JPS and uh, book on Leviticus has a wonderful description. I can't, can't remember, it might, uh, I can't remember who did numbers. I don't think it's Jeffrey Fige, but if someone remembers who's the editor, uh, feel free to say so. But really a wonderful chapter there comparing um, the two central ordeals by tri trial by ordeal that the suspected adulteress in the ancient Near East is put through. One is water, right? We see water here as well, but there she's thrown into a body of water. If she floats or swims, she is innocent and vindicated. And if she sinks, she is guilty, right? So if she essentially dies or drowns, then we know she's guilty. The other trial is fire, and here she's burned, and if the burn heals, she's innocent, and if it doesn't heal, she's guilty. Now, I'm bringing that because Bible scholars, as I said, are you know, drawn to this text and point out that there's nothing physically harmful about the ordeal. So they, they point out two things. Number one, there's nothing else like this in the entire Torah. We don't, we don't have ordeals. We don't have this idea of promising you a particular outcome. If we're gonna test you, and then we're gonna see uh, this response equals guilty, this response equals innocent. This is, this is unusual. Number two, it is not a physically harmful test. In other words, she's gonna drink water with a little dirt and some ink, which of course was made from natural, uh, natural products, erased the power of the ritual is that God's name is invoked and a curse is cast on the water. And that's the power of the ritual, but it's not a harmful, it's not burning and it's not drowning, right? The ritual itself is a, a fairly harmless ritual, the power being in all of the, all of the, uh, the, 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 what goes on around it, where she's placed, how she's treated, what she's told, all of that is certainly going to be powerful psychologically, spiritually, but it's not a harmful ritual. And they're very uh, careful to, to emphasize that, that her body is actually not harmed by the ritual. It's harmed by the supernatural. It's harmed by the power of suggestion. Any of those things are possible, but there's a clear difference in how the Torah presents uh, its trial. So now let's take a look at, uh, at what goes on here. So a man brings his wife, his woman, to the Kohen. Now, largely this text is about her presumed guilt. And this verse takes us back to that presumption. Why? First of all, the, the offering, there has to be an offering because we're now with the Kohen and it seems like we're, we're in the Mishkan. Uh, we're gonna take water from the Mishkan and the dirt from the floor of the Mishkan. And it's a very poor plain offering. And look what it's called. Minchat knaot, minchat zikaron maskerat avon. 
meaning three times we're basically told this is an offering that represents jealousy, sin, memory of the betrayal, right? So much of the text is really about her presumed guilt. And oh, by the way, she might be innocent. Okay. The Krivota Kohen Vehemita Lipnea Dodai. This is coming before God. The Kohen is just the conduit, the third party, but really, this is too big for the Kohen, too big for the husband. This is going before God. Right here's the Mishkan. The, the dirt is from the floor of the Mishkan. Again, we're told she is being she's standing before God. I'm busy writing a book, finishing a chapter on head covering for women. This is a very central verse. My article in the Jerusalem Post tomorrow is going to begin fleshing out some of this uh, because of the Sota connection. And uh, he bears her head or loosens her hair. It's not clear exactly what he's doing. And what we have here is she has to hold this minchat zikaron, this mincha of remembrance, minchat knaot, the mincha of jealousy. Right again, the assumption is she's guilty. She's being humiliated, right? Before God, she, her head, her hair, uh, it's a sign of her exposure. And, uh, and she's standing there before God and he's holding the water. And then uh, because I want to get to the Mishnah, I'm going to uh, skip over some of this. I'll just say Pasuk Kafalif, he makes her take an oath, the oath that is essentially a curse. And he basically says to her, you will become a curse among your people. Your thigh will drop, your belly will swell. And the water is going to come into your intestines. It's going to cause your belly to swell and your thigh to drop again. Bible scholars do a lot of beautiful work in scaffolding the text and explaining the, uh, the journey we take and the structure of, uh, of these psukim. I'm not going to do that. I don't have time. But really, the woman's only active job here is to say amen, amen to the curse that will befall her if she is guilty when she drinks the water. And I wanna say again, that the scholars are very clear. She does not die. Nowhere in the Torah do we, say, do we see that she dies. That's gonna be later in the Mishnaic and Talmudic texts. What happens here is there is some impairment to her fertility and sexuality. Her belly swells, her thigh drops. Not clear exactly what uh, the, 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 what, what is happening to her. Perhaps again, she walks around in a state of false pregnancy, right? Her swollen belly suggests fertility, but her womb is empty, right? It's also possible, uh, it, it's not clear what, do, does anyone see the consequence of the water except the priest herself and her husband, given that she'd be wearing robes, right? She, her body is not exposed. Does she become a curse among her people because she never bears child again. Um, it's, there's an ambiguity to what the consequence is beyond the consequence within her body, right? belly swelling, thigh dropping. Her husband could divorce her. We know that from Sefer Dvarim. It seems as if her husband chooses not to divorce her, but wants to have validation of his suspicions. And there will be validation because there will be this very acute response within her body she will remain cursed within her people, whatever exactly that will look like. And if she's not, let's skip down to Kavchet. Oh, by the way, the woman who's innocent, whose husband just has a fit of jealousy, well, nothing will happen to her, right? If, if she's lo nitma'a and she's tahora, v'nikta, the water cleanses as opposed to uh, poisoning her. And then seed will be planted within her uh, from his shechvat zera, of course. This is the Torah of jealousy, right? Uh, when a woman goes astray, again, the presumption of guilt is very clear throughout, except the lone psukim about the woman who's lo nitma'ah. Oh, 
איש אשר תעבור עליו רוח קינה וקינה את אשתו והעמיד האישה לפני אדוני ועשה לה הכהן את כל התורה הזאת. Or he just has a fit of jealousy and she's, she's not, you know, she's not guilty. Now, this is a very difficult pasuk, I think, for modern readers. Even in the second case, where he drags her through this process, he erases the name of God because of unbased, you know, um, unsubstantiated jealousy. The woman will bear her sin if she's guilty, but the man, regardless, will be cleaned, will be cleansed of any sin, even the sin of humiliating his wife, right, which, which we might think is problematic given uh, the beginning of where I started, mal um, Hashem, right, if he does a chatat ha'adam, the Torah tells us this is not a chait, he'll be cleansed of his sin, um, and perhaps, again, this is, in, uh, this is meant to incentivize men who have tremendous jealousy, ruach kina, to go through this route rather than hold it within themselves, maybe. Again, he bears no consequence for this process, even if she's innocent, if she's guilty, she will bear her sin. So really that is uh, the end of the biblical text. Very, very interesting. It's called the Torah taknaot, uh, the idea that there is a Torah uh, that addresses jealousy. Okay, what I wanna look at next and, um, because I really want to make sure to get to the Midrashic text. I'm going to do a lot of summarizing here. The Mishnah is really amazing. The Mishnah is amazing because its focus is neutralizing the possibility of the woman being really innocent. In other words, one of the things that makes us uncomfortable is lo nitma'a, that she's tahora. Now, it's true at the end, v'nikta v'nizra zara, zara, right? That, oh, she gets this reward of fertility. And that tells everybody she has been innocent and her husband knows she's innocent and she bears child. And perhaps that's meant to be the renewal of the faithfulness between the couple that they'll engage in sexual relations and the niktav and nizra zera in you know, some form of purity. In contrast, the guilty woman, her belly, she walks around with her belly swollen, her thigh uh, dropped. Uh, again, not clear exactly what that means, but it suggests impairment of the area in which she betrayed her husband. And so uh, certainly she walks around that way with no Zara and whatever plays out in their marriage will play out. Um, but now we get to the Mishnah and the Mishnah does something very interesting. The Mishnah now takes Bikinat Ishto, who's jealous of his wife in the Torah and says that suggests a verb, an action. And we're gonna turn Kina into Kinui which is warning. In other words, we're now going to add a two-step process to a man's ability to accuse his wife of adultery. No longer is this ruach kina, this kind of ambiguous, undefined feeling, going to be the, um, the, the platform by which a man can take his wife to the Kohen. We're going to change that. We're going to do what the Mishnah often does. We're going to create a protocol and a definition for when and how and where and what happens when a man accuses his wife. The Torah gives us the structure, the general structure, and now we're going to flesh it out into something applied, into something concrete. And that means there has to be a due process. And it looks like this. A man has to warn his wife in front of two witnesses. It's no longer this unsubstantiated, kind of amorphous ruach kina. He actually has to stand before two men and say, I am jealous or I am warning you, my wife, about your relationship with so-and-so. It can't be all men. It has to be a specific man, right? So again, we're now narrowing the scope, narrowing the focus, very, very clear protocol. He first has to warn his wife, you, I am suspicious, I am jealous of Yaakov the milkman. And I can't keep it in my, in my stomach. I can't keep it in my kishkas and just let it out at my wife. I now actually have to admit this before two other men that I am jealous of a specific person. And then the second stage is called stira. Remember we said nistara, right? The, the, aid, uh, the nistara, the aid in Bashi has concealed the evidence in the Torah. Now we turn that into stira. She actually has to be seen 
secluding herself with the man in question. So not just any man, if he warned her about Yaakov and she secludes herself with Yosef, he can't bring her before the Kohen. There has to be a clear process, warning about Yaakov, stira with Yaakov, witnesses, not to the adultery, because obviously if we could witness the adultery, we would have clarity and, and that would be a capital crime. It's the, uh, it's the un, uh, un, uh, unproven suspicion that she's behaving badly with Yaakov, the flirting, the joking, uh, the teasing, the little notes maybe uh, he finds, and then warning and stira, seclusion. So we've changed the, uh, the, the less defined ruach kina into something very, very clear, which makes it almost impossible for a woman to be blamed. In other words, this idea of alonit ma'av v'tahara disappears in the Mishnah. I, I would suggest that perhaps that too bothers the rabbis of the Mishnah. The idea that it's so undefined. Ruach Kina is so, can someone please mute themselves? I'm, I'm hearing some background noise. Um, thank you. So, um, so the Mishnah already takes a different turn. He warns her and she has to seclude herself. And then the Mishnah says, how does he warn her? If he says to her in front of two witnesses, do not speak with that man, with Yaakov and she spoke with him, that means nothing. Like you're gonna warn your wife against speaking to a man? That's ridiculous. Women speak to men all the time. The milkman has to deliver the milk. The shoemaker has to bring the shoes over. She has to go to the shoemaker and drop off the shoes. Don't be ridiculous. That's too much power, says the Mishnah. We can't prevent women from speaking to men in our society. So if he says to her, don't speak, and she speaks, that means nothing. We're not, we're not interested in speaking. What concerns us is if she entered a private place with him and a witness or maybe two sees her going into the back room, the, the, where, the storeroom in the, the Makola and shutting the door and she's there long enough, right? And they have a whole uh, almost amusing discussion in the Gemara, how long would it take? By the way, Masters and Johnson would say two to seven minutes. They, they are the modern, uh, uh, kind of studies of mo uh, modern sexuality. The Gemara, I think, comes to like seven to nine, right? You have Sorry, to I know what happened. Um, can you please mute yourself, hold on. Um, Emmanuel, I don't know if you're there, but could you uh, mute everyone for a second? So um, do not speak. So if she goes into a private place long enough, it can't be a minute. If she goes into the back room and the door shuts and she comes out within a minute, not a sota. So what the Mishnah essentially does is narrow over and over again the possibility of her becoming a sota she, and, and, and makes it much more difficult for her to be blameless. She is being seen behaving promiscuously with a particular man in a particular place, and there are witnesses to that. Okay. Um, in addition, I'll also say, I'm gonna have to skip some of the great, uh, the great Mishnahs here, but she also has the ability to confess. That also is completely different. She essentially throughout the Mishnah is able to say, I did it. And if she says that, she doesn't have to go through the process. The consequence is not small, divorce without tuba. But on the other hand, she has a certain amount of control of whether she goes through the process or not. It's not her husband dragging her to the priest against her will, with her will, whatever. Here she can throughout the process say, I did it. I'm Tmeya, or I refuse to drink. I'm not admitting anything, but I refuse to drink. So what happens there? Divorce without Ketuba. In addition, and this to me is also very interesting. Um, hold on one second. The following, sorry, uh, Mishnah number three, because I want to show the husband becomes accountable by his behavior as well. Not only does he have to warn her in front of two witnesses, not have an ambiguous ruach kina, but something very defined and documented. Number, Mishnah three, the following are prohibited to eat truma. Essentially, this is a woman married to a Kohen and she can't eat truma because um, she is now suspected of adultery. She must go through the process in order to re resume uh, a marriage with her husband and eat the truma. She who says to her husband, I am unclean to you. 
and witnesses came and testified that she was unclean, obviously. She who says, I refuse to drink. She whose husband does not want to make her drink. The husband at a certain point says, I, I regret this. Let's take it back. Let's start over. Once he warns her and she secludes herself, there's no no backseats. You can't go back, dude. You've got to like be aware there is consequence for you of unleashing this process. So think really, really well. If you at a certain stage after beginning the process, opening the file, say, I don't, I don't want to go through with this. I don't want her to drink. You know what? I love her. I forgive her. You know what? You don't get to do that at a certain stage in the process. You could do it very early on. Maybe after quinoa, you can go to the witnesses and say, you know what? Take it back. But after Stira, there's nothing to talk about. You've already bothered the court. You've already documented some of your suspicions. You can't take it back. Think well. So now the Mishnah shows us that the husband also has to be aware that he's accountable and responsible and there's consequence for him too. And she whose husband had intercourse with her on the journey. In other words, if the husband begins to take her towards Jerusalem and on the way in a moment of passion, maybe love, they have relations, it's over. <laughs> you, 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 can't, uh, you can't have it both ways. You can't continue to suspect your wife and have relations with her. It's all or nothing for you. So here too, we have two situations in which the woman breaks the right. She can say, I'm unclean and I refuse to drink, in which case it's over. And if he says, I don't wanna do this anymore or he has relations with her, it's over. So again, there's a lot more balance here in terms of the power dynamic between husband and wife. And in terms of the mission of basically saying to the husband, you know, you, you're losing control of the situation here. We're taking over some of it and we're giving her some of the power. Okay. By the way, they go to the court. They don't go to the priest, right? That, I mean, the priest will be involved later on, but the court becomes involved in the situation and so on. Unfortunately, I don't have time to do Mishnah Dalid in chapter two. This is the famous Mishnah of, um, uh, of what happens to her when she drinks the water. I'm going to skip. Chapter five, um, just as the water checks her, look at the language of the Mishnah. Now, that's an amazing statement because it's not clear from the Mishnah who is drinking the water. Is it the husband or is it the lover? Now, first of all, we know who the lover is because there's been Kinoi and Stira. In the Torah, I don't necessarily know who the lover is. He doesn't know who the lover is. The lover is completely absent from the Torah. It's nistara. It's hidden within her body. He may not even know exactly who it is. He has an undefined suspicion. Something's wrong. But in the Mishnah, I know who the lover is because there's been kinoe and stira. So just as the water checks her, so the water checks him. So the pshat of the, well, I should say the Bartanura, Ramba, both understand this to mean the boel the adulterer, the lover, he also has to drink. It's not fair that she's the only one who drinks when we have a name and a face for the lover. So she's not gonna stand there alone. He has to stand there with her. I will say that I wonder, well, maybe the husband drinks. There's an ambiguity, oto ota, who's the oto? Now, this leads the Tosvot Yom Tov to say, look, I now have to explain why the Bartanura says it's clearly the Boel, and he goes through and uh, he unpacks the rest of the Mishnah. But the fact that he has to explain it already says to me, there's ambiguity. In other words, is it the lover and the husband? Is it just the husband? Because we wanna check if he's been faithful as well, or, and so on. There's, there's a lovely ambiguity here. So I will say the majority interpretation is the lover, I'm going to leave this that within the shot, I think there's ambiguity. Okay, and there's one more thing I want to show you, the, the bold at the bottom of the next uh, Mishnah, Misha Rabu Haminafim Pasku Hamayim Haramari. The Mishnah at the very end, this is Mishnah Tet, the last chapter of Sota, one of the last Mishnahs, if not the last Mishnah. When adultery proliferates, there's no reason to continue this, this ceremony. In other words, the Mishnah says all of this works 
when it can be a deterrent, when there's fear, when there's trembling at the mention of Sota, when there's a mystique, when there's a mysteriousness. But when adultery becomes commonplace, when even today, I wouldn't say we shrug when we hear someone has had an affair, but we're certainly not as shocked as we might have been 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Nathaniel Hawthorne and Hester Prynne, where she has to wear the big A, we don't, we don't do that. When we hear about adultery, we're saddened, we're sorry, we wonder why, but certainly we don't have shock and we don't normally eject an adulterer from our society. That's what Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai or the Mishnah is saying, when adultery is everywhere, when men and women are committing adultery and it no longer shocks us, the ritual of the sota is no longer relevant. When it works as a deterrent, when just the name sota strikes fear and awe in the hearts of those who hear it, then we can continue with the sota. But when it becomes commonplace, when adultery becomes commonplace, there is no reason to erase God's name in order to uh, resolve this situation. We're gonna have to move into other, uh, other solutions, other ways of uh, resolving this and so on. And so really that becomes the end of the sota. Uh, the, the sota disappeared, meaning already in the Mishnah, they say, look, it, it's, no longer, it's no longer relevant. It no longer is a deterrent. It no longer has the power to uh, make people think twice before uh, betraying a woman, uh, think twice before committing an act of betrayal. And now we have to move into, into other, uh, other possibilities. So, um, so the mission, as I said, the reason I bring the mission is to show a shift. First of all, a very applied shift. How do we apply this? How do we do this? What does this mean? Um, uh, how, do we, how do we narrow it so it's only a guilty woman, a woman who is not blameless? How do we create a, a better balance between the husband and wife? Uh, how do we shift to the court so the court becomes involved in this? And ultimately, uh, what do we do when adultery proliferates? We sadly uh, have to shrug our shoulders and move into other uh, areas of response, uh, halakhic areas of response and so on. But the SOTA will no longer uh, uh, be uh, the mechanism by which we test the faithfulness or unfaithfulness of, uh, of a woman. Okay, so that's the end of the mission. Now in the 20 minutes I have, I really wanna show you two midrashim. Um, two midrashim that really uh, through the midrash, we get into something much more personal, much more human. What I did is we looked at the Torah text, we brought up various interpretations, we illuminated some of the difficulties uh, of the text, and yet also the power of the ordeal, the role of Bnei Hashem, of Bnei Adonai, the idea of Mi'ilah, what it represents, the idea of what happens at the end of the process, the woman who is, um, who is essentially proven to be unfaithful, the woman who, and, and, and is a curse among her people, the woman who was cleansed by the waters. We then looked at the Mishnah and what the Mishnah does in, in such a Mishnaic way, right, is uh, turn it into much more of a legal, a legal process, a protocol, uh, something that has more balance between husband and wife, and ultimately an awareness that uh, uh, this is not working. Now I want to look at the at the two uh, midrashic sources because I think through the midrash, perhaps uh, we can get the human component, the uh, the the human the humanness of the story. And um, what I want to bring you here is a midrash in, in brachot a midrash that is going to show something really, really different, a very different read of the, uh, of the Torah. What the midrash here sees is through the lens of a barren woman, an opportunity to force God to open her womb by using the parsha of the Sota. And I want to comment on how wonderfully insightful this is I don't always say that about uh, uh, text, midrashic texts or Talmudic texts about women, but this particular midrash is spot on because what we see at the end, the Nikta v'nizra'a zera, the Gemara suddenly says, or the midrash says, wait a minute, there's a promise of fertility in the Torah, not through prayer and not through fasting, that may or may not work. But this is a surefire guarantee that God will open the womb of a woman 
if she only goes through the process of the sota. And I say, if she only, because Chazal understand the desperateness it's, of a barren woman is I'll such finish with the right. that she will expose herself to abject humiliation, to this terrible exposure, to jealousy on the part of her husband that might even ruin her marriage in order to have her child. And when I read this, I cannot help but think about the many testimonies I have heard and written about women and couples going through fertility treatment. Years and years of humiliating, painful, toxic fertility treatments that at times threaten the core of marriage and the woman often refusing to give up over and over with the hope. And I think Chazal were right, that a woman would be drawn to this pasuk as a way of forcing the hand of God to give her a child. Havali banim umayayim neta anochi, says Rachel. I might as well die if I don't have a child. And what we're going to see here is Chana, the, the Midrash hones in on Chana and gives her a voice. And in the voice, Chana is going to go to no less than God and say to God, threaten God, essentially. If you don't carry through on your promise in Sota, your Torah will be rendered plaster, will be rendered a, a, a nothingness, emptiness. And the pasuk that the Midrash uh, focuses on, that she takes a vow and she says, Adonai Tzvaot, I get wonderful Midrash and Brachot, look it up, Lamed Aleph Amud Bet. If you see, you will see at the, uh, the, the affliction of your handmaiden. And look what the Midrash does. Imra o Amar Rabbi Elazar, Amra Chana Lifnea Kadosh Baruch Hu, Ribona Shalola. Imra O, if you see my plight, Mutab. If my prayer works and you open my womb because of my prayer and my suffering, Mutab, it is well. The Imlav, Tir'ed, God, you will see. Look at what I'll do. Eilech the Estater Bifne Al Kana Ba'ali. You know what, God, I'm going to do? You're not going to answer me. You're not going to see my affliction. You're not going to open my womb. I'm not going to threaten you, God, with your Torah. Because I'm going to go and I'm going to do stira. And I'm going to make my husband so jealous that they're going to force me to drink the May Sota. But be aware, God, it's not forcing me. I want this. I welcome the waters of the Sota. And if you don't give me a child then, your Torah will be plaster, will essentially be like an emptiness. You're not going to follow through, God. You promised something. You, God, have promised me a child. If I am Torah, and I guarantee you, God, I'll be Torah. It's all, I'll pay the guy off. We'll go into a room. We'll play cards. My husband will be insanely jealous. And then, God, you will have to give me a child. I'm not going to go through the rest of the Midrash, meaning... The, the Midrash then says, oh my God, imagine if women get a hold of this. Imagine if less scrupulous women do what Hannah's threatening to do, some of them are going to commit adultery. Oh my God, this is a terrible idea, right? But I don't want to go into how the Midrash responds. What's powerful here is through the lens of a barren woman, this passage, which so many, re I teach women all the time and they're so bothered by the innocent woman who was brought through the process, the Midrash says, don't be so bothered because the barren woman sees here a promise, a promise of fertility, and she's willing to use it. So I love the subversiveness of the reading that instead of the woman being vulnerable, being exposed, being humiliated, the Hana here takes charge of this text and use it as it essentially to get what she most wants, which is a child, right? So again, a beautiful Midrashic reframing that sometimes our initial response to a text, if we go below the, the words or in between the spaces, something else entirely comes up. And through the lens of a barren woman, this text offers hope. Wow, that's like an incredible reading. Okay. What I wanna finish with is um, uh, something else entirely. And then I, I have very little time, so I'm gonna read it in English. 
And I want to leave this. This is a great story, and I suggest you you take it home and maybe over Shabbos look at it. Tani Rabbi Yishmael, I'm just going to read the opening in Hebrew because I don't have it in English. Gadol Shalom, Sheshem HaGadol Shenichav B'Kdusha, Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu Yimche B'Mayim, Kedei Lahatil Shalom Ben Yishlisha. So this is a famous uh, statement of Rabbi Yishmael, that peace is so important. The idea of shalom, the concept of shalom is so important to God that God is willing to have his name erased in order to restore peace between husband and wife. Okay. And of course, this too is focused entirely on the woman who is tohora, the woman who is innocent. That jealousy can bring such toxicity into a relationship that only the name of God can essentially redress or renew the faithfulness, the sense of faithfulness between the two. And God is willing to be the marriage counselor, if you will, the marriage arbiter, the arbiter that will bring back peace. And now we have a story. So the Midrash in Vayikra Rabbah opens up with the statement of Rabbi Yishmael, and it's going to end with the statement of Rabbi Yishmael. And I want a totally different lens to look at uh, a suspicious husband. Rabbi Meir used to sit and teach on the Shabbat nights. He would teach Friday night, a dry, he would give a shear. A certain woman was there listening to him. And apparently he opened up the shear to women. Once his discourse was extended, he did what many of us are tempted to do, which I will not do, go beyond the allotted time of the shear. Because Rabbi Meir loves his Torah and his Torah is amazing. It's fascinating, it's brilliant. And sometimes he's so caught up in Torah that he goes beyond the hour of the shear. And one Friday night, this happened, and she waited until he had finished this discoursing. Because how could she walk out? Meaning he was supposed to speak from 9 to 10. He keeps talking until 10.30. She's caught up in his wonderful, brilliant Torah. Also, it's rude. It's not Derek Haritz. And she waits until the end of the shear. She went home and found the candle already extinguished, which, again, brilliant writing here because the candle extinguished is because on Friday night, you can't really light the candle, that's technical. But in addition, the candle represents Friday night, the passion, the idea that Friday night is the ideal night for sexual intimacy between husband and wife, between passion. The candle's been extinguished. He knows she comes home at 10.05, 10.15, 10.20, 10.30. He knows she's at a shear of Rebbe Mayer and, uh, and the candle is extinguished. Her husband said to her, sorry for the typo, where were you? She said to him, I was sitting and listening to the teacher. That's all I was doing. I was listening to Torah. He said, I swear to you, you will not enter here until you go and spit in the face of the teacher. And basically he says to her, I don't care. He has now become unreasonably jealous. Maybe not unreasonably. He is now jealous. What kind of man keeps you from our marital bed? What is going on here? And you know what? you won't vindicate my jealousy until you go and spit in his face so that I know you absolutely have no feelings for him. She stayed away the first week, a second, a third. She can't do it. So now there's another man who essentially is causing a breakdown in her marriage. It's Rebbe Mayer, the big Torah scholar, who because of his Torah, his fascinating Torah, his brilliant Torah has caused a rift. And by the way, three weeks out of, home, out of the home, out of the marital uh, bedroom, the marriage is about to fall apart. Meaning Beit Shammai, Beit Hillel says you can go a week, you can go two weeks. It's been three weeks. It's a very deliberate usage of time. This marriage might not be rehabilitated because of Rabbi Meir, because of a, a Torah scholar and his brilliant Torah. Her neighbor women said to her, are you still angry with each other? Now the neighbor women come in. Instead of the Kohen, instead of the courts, the neighbor women are the third party. We will come with you to the teacher. And basically it's the neighboring women who say, die enough already. You have to go home. This is ridiculous. You're not gonna, what are you gonna do if your husband divorces you? Rebbe Mayer's not gonna take you in. We've gotta go help you resolve this. What Rebbe Mayer saw then, he saw by the Holy Spirit, he sees everything. And what I like about this is Rebbe Mayer is now gonna take responsibility. Rebbe Mayer inadvertently, he didn't mean to do this, but by teaching women, by being this brilliant, charismatic Torah scholar, he stepped over a boundary. The boundary was finishing your shear on time so the women can go home to their husbands. Instead, he kept them, he delayed them, caused this situation, and he's now going to take responsibility, which I think is uh, one of the most beautiful lessons in the story.
He said to them, is there anyone among you who has learned in the magical curing of eyes? Magical curing of eyes is spitting. It appears throughout the Talmud. Her neighbor said to her, now go and spit in his face and you will be permitted to your husband. Her neighbor said, oh my God, here's an opportunity. He's asking for someone to spit in his face. That's what your husband wanted. Go do it. When she sat before him, she withdrew from him. She can't do it. She said to him, Rebbe, I, I don't know how to do this, the magical curing of eyes. He said to her, spit in my face seven times. And now go tell your husband, you said one time, I spat seven times. Now, the number seven is also deliberate. Seven is the creation of the world. Essentially, Rabbi Meir has to recreate this marriage. He has to recreate the world, so to speak. He says to her, tell your husband you spat seven times. So he, you make it very clear. You have no feelings for me. There is nothing going on here. Seven days of the week, essentially, right? A griot olam, if you will, and go back and your husband will be assured. And I too will be reminded that I contributed to this very problematic situation. Again, inadvertently, without any feelings, but I too was responsible. His disciples are horrified. Rebbe, are we permitted to dishonor thus the Torah? Should you not have requested one of us to do an incantation? He said to them, is it not enough for mayor? He doesn't even say Rabbi Mayor, mayor to be like his maker. And then he quotes Rabbi Ishmael. And he basically says, if God's name can be erased, I too can be humiliated in the process of reconciling husband and wife. And what I hear is even more, I too have to be responsible. I too have to be part of the process of rehabilitation because I inadvertently caused this situation. And I too need a reminder, boundaries. I too have to be humiliated in the process of redressing this wrong. And, um, and, and my takeaway from this, and there's again, uh, certainly, I hope you'll continue to think about this story and, and the role of Rebbe Mayer and the husband and wife and so on. It's something I think about as a teacher, about proper boundaries. As a teacher, I teach men, I teach women, and so on. Um, uh, even within the world of Torah scholarship, the world of the Beit Midrash, constant awareness of appropriate boundaries of behavior must be, uh, uh, must be the focus of anyone working in, uh, in, in the field of Torah and study and, and scholarship and so on when we come into contact with other people. And what I also like is the need at times, the Kohen, the Beit Din, the neighboring women, Rabbi Meir, of third parties to intervene when there is a toxic situation that unfolds within family and particularly marital dynamics. And I think if we talk about a, a modern read, Perhaps one of the most modern reads is, first of all, there are times marriages cannot be rehabilitated. When there's abusive behavior, when there's toxic behavior, when there's potential harm, then we must help, uh, uh, we must intervene and help the couple, uh, uh, help the couple uh, separate, uh, give protection to whoever the abused party is. And sometimes we need a third party in either, in order to rehabilitate, to restore faith uh, in the relationship, to create okay. a riyat olam, so to speak, uh, in uh, moving forward in the marriage. And so just to summarize, I have, I have really only four minutes and I'm just gonna take one minute and maybe some comments for comments. Please, please mute yourself. Um, we've looked at the biblical text. We transition to the, we transition to the rabbinic text. Please, um, Avram Winter, uh, let me mute you. Sorry, I, I can do that. Um, please mute yourself. There we go. Um, uh, so we transition to the rabbinic text, and I wanted to end with are really two different voices that come out of the midrashic text. Very, very human. Very, very poignant. Sometimes we, the way we read a text, is not the only way to read a text. That from within the text, we can find multiple perspectives and meanings. The power of the text is uh, the ability for it to be interpreted for thousands of years through the lens of the different people who read it. We saw that with Hannah. And then finally, the story with Rabbi Meir, uh, the idea that Rabbi Meir too takes responsibility for inadvertently overstepping a boundary and recognizing he has to be part of the process. Uh, he has to change perhaps his behavior when teaching Torah Friday night to men and to women, not stop teaching women, but create a, a more sure space with clearer boundaries. And finally, the neighboring women like the priest, like the baking representing at times, the need for intervention in, uh, in rehabilitation, in ensuring healthy and safe spaces within the marital and the family dynamic. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. And uh, I think I have like two minutes if anyone wants to comment or share a thought or an idea. 
um, I'm happy to hear. Okay, well, thank you very much. You certainly deserve a break. I know you only have 10 minutes. So thank you for inviting me to speak. And uh, I hope we will uh, meet again at other opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you.